You know, this week as I kept reading in Ephesians and I just kept reading, I couldn't stop. I just kept reading and reading. And I kept thinking about Paul and how different this man was who wrote the book of Ephesians and all the different books that he wrote in the New Testament. And I just kept reading and I kept thinking, why, why am I not more like this? Why are we not more engaged with God to the, to the level where nothing else matters? Have you ever wondered why some people meet Jesus and they're changed forever? We all know these people. There's, there's been a handful of people that we'll meet in our lives and we think, oh man, that woman was a woman that could pray and God would show up. That guy would begin to worship and God was just there. And we treat them like they're something special. And they're not. They are just like you and me. There's a woman that I knew and she's passed. Her name was uh, Mima. Is my friend's grandma. That woman would pray and you swear it was literally the voice of Jesus. Like, I mean, that woman would pray before you showed up, prayed after you left, and I mean, she'd look you in the eyes and you'd, you'd think, am I good? Boy, she's looking at my soul, man. That woman could pray. But we treat people like that like they're just special and we just kind of put them on a shelf. All, and sometimes we might even put people like, they're kind of crazy. Those people would travel all over. Man, those people would go to Africa for two weeks, forget that mess. We think about the person that literally starts talking next to us at work, not at my work, maybe y'all's work. This is a normal thing when they start talking about Jesus at my work. But like somebody, you'd be sitting there and somebody starts talking about Jesus and you might feel just that hint of uncomfortable, like, uh-oh, what if I have to say something now too? You know what I'm talking about. Man, because I've been there. Somebody asks a question about something in life, philosophy, and, and just deep, and you know the answer, and you go, mm, that, that includes Jesus. We're going to go there, and you get nervous, right? Why do we treat people that are so passionate about God, just the pursuit of him, their, their own pursuit kind of makes us nervous, and we kind of separate ourselves and distance ourselves. What happens then is then you start reading the scriptures as if these are just special people. They're just different from you and me, and I don't have to have anything to do with that kind of a world that gets real intense. I can separate myself, and I'm a good church-going person. Man, I've been a good church-going person. I grew up a good, good Christian boy. You ever heard that? I don't want to be a good Christian boy. I want to be the one that everybody's nervous of. You know what I mean? Like, oh, he shows up. We're all going to get in trouble. He's going to say things that's going to make us all uncomfortable. That's what I want to be. I want to be the kind of person like Paul who walks into a room and everybody's like, uh-oh, get ready. Man, the people in the early church, they were crazy like that. Do you want to be crazy like that? Do you want to be so desperate for God to show up that you'll do whatever it takes? Because now listen, you don't always listen to the, first, the last part. Are you desperate for God? You're like, yes, so you'll do whatever it takes. You're like, well, it depends. We all know this. We all know there's that reservation, that thing that wants to hold you back, that thing that weighs you down that says, I can't, I don't want to go all in because that's just radical. That's just unnecessary. I can read my Bible and know God. Do you know God so much that like, like Peter and John, they walk into the portico and a guy's asking for money and they fix their eyes on him? Man, that had to be uncomfortable. It makes you wonder how long he did that. Right? We, I read verses like this where he fixed his eyes on the man, and then he begins to speak to him about Jesus, right? I wonder if that was like a three-minute pause. And he's just listening for the Holy Spirit to tell him what's next. He's like, I know he wants money, Lord, but I don't got no money. And Jesus is like, you know what you do have? You got the Spirit in you that you could give to him, and he could get well. And uh, how long is this going in his brain when that dude's thinking like, Anybody else got money? And the guy's just staring. It's like, you know that look, right? It'll make you uncomfortable. Somebody stares at you too, like, what are you looking at? Sometimes we need to be so, like, passionate to just try to get in a moment with God. I love when Madison sings, right? Because Madison, Madison, I'm going to be real honest. Madison don't care about y'all sometimes. Because Madison just... Mm, she gets in her moment, and it's just, she is like, the only person in the room is Jesus now, and that's who she begins to worship. And I, can I, oh, can I, can I be honest? 
Cover up your toes, y'all. If you get uncomfortable sometimes because she gets a little too much for Jesus, maybe you should read it in the Old Testament about, that, about David who danced in his underwear, and his wife was like, mm, that's embarrassing. She got in trouble. If, I'm just saying it because sometimes, I'm just going to be real honest, I felt a little bit like, like what's, you come dance down here. The first time you danced, I love it now. The first time I was like, I don't know about that. The second time, I was like, that's real pretty, Lord. Third time, I'm like, get it, girl. Just whatever it takes, man. Just because, like, sometimes we got to get out of our own way. Am I verbalizing some stuff that some of you wish you could say, too? I, it's okay. This is a safe place. My wife said it this morning in prayer time. It's a safe place. It's okay. Girl, you just get it whenever you can, man. You just come up here, whatever it takes. I was raised in an environment that was safe. I don't want safe anymore. Paul was not happy with safe. I'm ready to look at people who are ready to move all over the world for Jesus, ready to talk to people they don't know about Jesus, ready to give all their money away. Jesus, I mean, like, come on, like, when we start talking about your money, that's going to hurt, right? We do have offering boxes in the house, and the Lord wants you to give, not just your 10%, but give till it hurts a little bit. You know why? Because he wants you to pour out and lavish on him everything because you got to trust him with it. You have to trust him with it. You getting tight on your finances, be like, well, I'll give you more, Jesus. Somebody once told me the simplest thing. If you hold money in your hand like this, how's the Lord going to put anything in it? And I was like, oh, that's really simple. I open it. That means he can take some out and put some in. You get the transfer thing happening there? You got to do that with your life. Sacrifice their jobs and their way of life. That people are crazy. They wake up and pray early in the morning and they stay awake with friends who need help. They consume themselves with getting more of God and just worshiping for hours, even fasting. We, we say all these things. These are things that are happening in Scripture constantly. It is the normal for a Christ follower. Yet for us, it's like I'll take my Sunday mornings and say thank you because that's safe, that's comfortable. What I'm loving about this church right now is we are beginning to step out into things that make us a little bit uncomfortable at times. And you know what that tells me? I got some more stuff I got to lay down. That also tells me I'm adventuring out there with Jesus. Peter didn't just walk on water because he thought he could. He walked on water because he was chasing the presence of God. Like it was out there and I got to get to it. Water's in the way. I don't care. I know y'all a little crazy. I know a bunch of y'all. Listen, in Acts chapter 9, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Acts chapter 9. We've been in this Ephesians run for a while, and I'm going to get into it a little bit, but I think we need to just pause and really talk about who wrote Ephesians and why it is that we read some of the things we read, and why is it that I should look like Jesus? Why should I do the things that Paul did? Why should I do what the early church did? Why, why is this in here? Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 9. We're talking about Paul. Now, in the scriptures, they'll refer to him sometimes as Saul, but he gets his name changed after what we're about to read, and it turns into Paul. So it says that as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. Now, keep in mind, Paul, or Saul at this moment, he's actually traveling to go persecute Christians. When I say persecute, I mean kill Christians. This is an intense moment. He's on the road to, to Damascus to go hurt people. And it says, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and it will be told you what to, you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now, I don't know about you, but I want God to show up in flashes of light where I can't even see or drink or eat for three days straight. Like, bring it on. Like, just wreck me. And then sometimes, you ever had those moments where you're like, God showed up, and you, and you wonder why things were happening? I wonder if his friends were like, that can't be of God, because if he can't see for three days, there's no way that was God. God told him to go to the city, but how can he go to the city if he can't even see? See, God will do things to you that will mess you up sometimes. 
He will take away things from you in a moment that you're like, no, no, Lord, what you told me to do requires what you took from me. But he needs you to rely only on him. Food, water, and sight, he doesn't need, but the presence of God, he does. And it showed up in a flash of light right in front of him. If you think these lights are bright, just wait. If we get into the presence of God, we're going to walk out of here like can't see for days. You think that God only did stuff like this in the Bible? You think God showing up, speaking to people, radically changing them were really only in the scriptures? That doesn't happen today. That can't happen today. You think when we read stories about Moses and how he watches water stand up so they can cross dry ground, that was just the scriptures. Miracles don't happen anymore. Peter falls into a trance on a rooftop and praise God we can eat meat now. Crazy things happen. A man walks down the street and his shadow heals people. Somebody speaks words and demons have to flee. They don't just speak words, they speak the name of Jesus. You can speak at it all day long, you're going to get hurt. It's the name of Jesus. But if we read these things and we, and we treat it like, like it's our old grandma, she gets to Jesus but nobody else does. We treat it like it's just some distant thing that in here are great stories about what it's going to be like someday in heaven. How long do we have to sing the words, heaven come, till you recognize what we're trying to see happen in the world around us? We could sing it for another two hours if it takes. Heaven come. Heaven come and mess us up a little bit. You see, the... Early church, even in America, had some revival break out and some crazy things happen. You ever heard of the Azusa Street Revival? There's Brownsville Revival. There's all sorts of revivals that have happened. You've heard of Billy Graham. He's no longer with us, but you can go watch old videos. Of that dude's stadium's just packed full of people, and he just preaches a little bit, and all of a sudden people are just crying and running forward, and you think, he wasn't that good of a preacher. How did that happen? He's just like all the others. Why, why can that one guy preach and like hundreds and hundreds of people are just running, thousands are running to the front just to give their lives to Jesus? How is that happening? Revival can happen in a moment, but it requires us getting ourselves out of the way and willing to just let God show up. It's always been about his presence. It's always been about God just showing up. And I know it's a hard concept to grasp, just dig in the scriptures. Even Jesus went up on the mountain to go see God and took some people with him, and he showed up. Remember, his face was just radiant. Moses did the same thing. There's just all sorts of moments when people just got to get in the presence of God. And speaking of revival, Paul was one of these men who started like an early church revival in the book of Acts, and then you read all of it going on. See, Paul, the presence of God shows up, and Paul has changed forever. He spends three days without sight, and he fasted. He begins this new faith journey. I want to ask you, how did your faith journey begin? This is one of my favorite things to ask is, tell me about the moment when, when Jesus showed up in your life. When I sit down and talk with somebody, that's always one of the first things is, I want to know. What happened for you? Sometimes the story goes like this. It'll say, man, I was just in this moment, and then God came, and my heart starts racing, and I just cried out, and, I just, and, you, and you hear the story about how something internally begins to shift, and they knew from that moment on they were eternally secured, and that they just wanted to chase after God forever. And then sometimes you'll hear stories about where they're like, well, so-and-so told me about God, and this person was really cool, and then this thing happened, and this, and this other story about how we traveled over here, and this thing, and you're telling me all this stuff about what happened that day, but not about Jesus. If Paul would have got knocked off the donkey, blinding a light for three days and all that stuff, if he'd have got him and been like, tell me about your faith journey, he'd been like, man, that was the best donkey I ever had. Man, it was great, and I fell off one day because God showed up. Uh, and, and, but then my friends were real good to me, man. We just had a good time after that. We went down to the city, had a good time. I'd be like, what about Jesus? What about that moment? And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I got saved. No, 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 no. What, what about the, the moment that everything changed for you? 
well, you know, things have been different. I pray more. Well, how's that working for you? Do you see what I'm saying? There's a moment when a shift really happens. A moment in your life when you encounter the presence of God and you go, I will never forget this moment. Matter of fact, when I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to pursue another moment like that and then another moment like that. I cannot get enough of God. I got to keep going. You see, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 1, he says, I, talking about himself, the prisoner of the Lord. You ever consider yourself a prisoner of the Lord where you're at his mercy? It's like, we're into I, a buddy of the Lord, that when it suits me, we can hang out. You ever have that friend, like all of them, like all your friends, some days you're just like, nah. Like, you want to hang out? You're like, eh, my couch is looking really good right now. We all, yeah, there's applause for that. Like, it's true, like, but if you're a prisoner of the Lord, it's like, I am at your mercy. I do what you tell me to do. I have no control, it's all in your hands. It says, I, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. You see, at this time, when Paul was going to Damascus, he was an expert, genius at the law, the smartest of the smartest, trained by the best. He was the man. He gets wrecked by God and has to humble himself. And all of his wisdom and all of his might and all of his goodness, he surrenders all of it to Jesus. Whatever you think you have, give it up. Lay it down. Because it says in Acts eleven twenty six that Barnabas and Paul, they had to spend an entire year together in Antioch. Why? Because he's having to learn how to walk this out. My wife reminded me this week about toddlers. We call them toddlers because they toddle. When you start walking out in your faith journey, sometimes it feels a little messy. You're like, am I getting this right? And you got to learn to really start walking in the Lord. Walk out what he wants in your life. Begin to walk and pursue him. You can't just get saved and take off running. Even Paul couldn't do that. Paul had to have friends around him, people around him. He didn't isolate himself. He had to get with some others to be trained, to be taught. And a man that knew that much, I wonder what they said. Be like, listen, buddy, you're going to sit here in Antioch for a year and learn from Barnabas. He's like, who's Barnabas? Why? I have to wait a year till I can start leading? Do you not know who I am? No, no, that conversation didn't happen. He said, I'm learning to walk. Put me under whoever. I'll spend as long as it takes, and I'll learn to walk. Our pride gets in the way, doesn't it? No, no, no. If they only knew the gifts that I had, I could serve so quick. I'd be the best. That's what we think in our minds, right? Yeah. I don't know if it's a gift, but it's, a, it's pride. But we think we know what's best. And what happens in that moment, what would have happened if he'd have gone into Antioch, and in that moment, he'd have been like, man, I know God was good, but there's no way that I'm going to sit under somebody for a year. There's no way that I'm going to submit myself to just a man. I, it's me and God. He would have never learned to walk. He'd have toddled for the rest of his life. You ever met people who just seem to be like not really figuring it out their entire lives in their faith? They just, man, there's always ups and downs and all over the place. They just can't figure it out. They, have, they may have known Jesus for a while, but man, they are still just all over the place. Man, the, the slightest bit of wind terrifies them. It's just like the minute that something goes wrong, all of it goes loose. The God doesn't love me. It's all out the window. Fair weather. Man, when the weather's good and everything's going well, as long as those paychecks are coming in, I can pay my bills. God is good. It's easy to walk on a good day. When you look at your checking account and the bill comes in, you're like, there ain't enough there. I, the prisoner of the Lord, say, walk. Keep walking. I love in Acts 13, 2, it says, in this uh, moment, it says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting... It's talking about Paul and Barnabas. They're hanging out in Antioch, and it says, while they're ministering to the Lord and fasting. That means they were worshiping God. They were just worshiping. Man, if there's anything you can find about people in scriptures when they did miraculous things, it's because they were willing to worship God. 
Worship him. And when I say worship, worship is, means pouring it out because he's good. Not because you're like, oh, God, I love you so much. I wish you'd take care of this and you could take care of that. That's not worshiping. You're, you're asking for good stuff again. Just take for a moment and say, God, you are so good. I'm going to do whatever it takes right now just to sing louder, to pour out anything I got. Everything I have is yours, God. You want it? I give it to you, God, because you're good. I'll lay down. I'll dance. I'll walk. I'll just sit in my seat. I'll just cry for a minute. Whatever, God, I just give it to you. It just, I just want it out. I just, it just boils up, and it just rolls out, and I just keep singing, and I just keep singing, and I keep praising. That's what they did. They're ministering to the Lord, and, and all of a sudden, you see that something beautiful begins to happen. As I read in 16, Psalm 1611 says this, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Sometimes we spend all of our time just telling him, tell me what to do, tell me what to do. Where do I go, where do I go? And he says, just worship me. You're like, I don't have time. I need to know what to do. In his presence He will make known to me the path of life because in his presence is fullness of joy. And as Paul and Barnabas are sitting there, something begins to happen. See, as we grow up in our faith, we no longer have to walk. We can begin to pick up the pace. Hebrews 12.1, it says, Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It wasn't just Paul, it was Paul and Barnabas. And it was a group of elders and some others that were pouring into each other. It's us. Freedom was never meant to be alone. Freedom was through us. We begin to walk it out as a group of people to minister to the Lord so he can show us where to go and what to do and then experience joy in those moments. If you come in for worship just because it's a good transition to get some preaching, you're missing it. Run with endurance. Remember, this is not a sprint. When I say run, most of you think you just run like it's a sprint. This is running with endurance. And what I love about this, I watched this thing on Netflix about people who run the endurance race on the Appalachian Trail. And it's really cool because the, the fun part is they train and they train and they train. And then they start running on this trail. And you'll notice there's moments they have to actually stop and eat and sleep because you can't run it all in one, one go. It takes weeks. And they just run and run and run. They have to stop and look at the map. Am I going in the right direction? Because they're running with endurance. What will happen is sometimes we will have that Paul moment where God shows up. And we think in our flesh, I'm just going to take off running. I'm going to serve everywhere and give it all and just, just take off running. And we're running so hard. And what happens? <laughs> Burnout. There are a lot of people sitting in this room who have burned out and never figured out what to do next. You made it down the trail a good ways. You made it down the trail and now you're just laying there and you said, I ran a good race. And you keep getting mad at all these people who keep passing you up and running. And you're getting older and older. And you have no more purpose. You have no clue what's next in your life. You just keep getting madder and madder as people keep running past you on the trail. You have to learn to walk. You have to learn to mend yourself and get back up. Get into the presence of God and he'll tell you what's next. And you'll just keep moving. Can't do it alone. Acts 13, 3 says, The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. In the moment of ministering to the Lord and fasting, God shows up and he tells them, These two are mine. Send them for my work. We think we got to get that part first and then I'll go worship. Tell me what's next, Lord, then I can worship you because then I won't have any, anything holding me back. We think when we have all these thoughts of things that are weighing us down, and we think of all these encumbrances, these things that keep us from running, we think that's the stuff that makes I need resolution here first. Now I can run. But in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, let us lay aside every encumbrance, even the sin that entangles us. Lay all of that down and then begin to worship so he can show you where to go. 
But if you just lay there and you just, I don't know what to do next, Lord. I'm just upset and I'm just mad and I'm frustrated and I got burned out or I ran too hard. I didn't even learn to walk. Whatever it is, there's this moment you have to realize you have to get into his presence and experience his joy. And he'll show you the steps to take so you can begin to walk again. So you can begin to run with endurance. Paul is a man that ran with endurance. This dude's in a prison and didn't slow down. He's like, bring me pen and paper. We go to prison, like literal prison. We'd be like, I'm done. Why am I here, Lord? I'm mad now. We think with some justifiable reason of just to be mad at God and just throw it all away. And he just says, if you'll get in my presence, I'll tell you what to do next. There is joy in that moment. Your calling can be found in his presence. See, Paul spends the rest of his life pursuing God and trying to write to others to show them how to get there. He's telling them, learn to walk, learn to run, get in this, do this with me. And he's trying to encourage them always because what happened to him on day one when he experienced God, it changed him forever. He couldn't do anything else. I doubt he ever woke up a single day after that and thought like, you know what, I think I'm going to change professions I'm going to go be a fisherman. No. It wrecked him so much. Everything changed. His desperation to be able to just to share the gospel with people, to share them the thing that changed him so deeply, it just drove him to do crazy things. I want to do that. I want to be surrounded by people who are just desperate for God and desperate for other people to see that too. I love it because our church is here to connect you to Jesus and equip you for his purpose. How are you going to get equipped? You get in his presence. It's a beautiful thing to just show up and just sit with God. And it's hard. You ever just try to be still and be with God for a moment? The mind just races with all the things you should be doing, doesn't it? Can we, can we just get to a place at least where we can start learning to walk and just set everything down and sit with God? He doesn't even have to say anything, right? Because his presence is so good. Just, just the fact that he comes is good, and I can just experience joy and happiness. I don't even need you to talk. Just, just be with me, God. So today... Is your day. If I can get the band to go ahead and come up here. Listen, in scripture, there's moment after moment where someone said, lay hands on me because I want what you got. Elisha did it with Elijah. He's like, I want what you got. And that dude just pursued him and he followed him. There's other moments when Paul writes to Timothy and he says, don't neglect the gift that you got by the laying on of hands by the elders. There are moments when I look at somebody and say, man, I want what you got. I need a little bit of what you got in my life. We're going to do that this morning. I want to give you all a chance. And we're going to sing this song first for just a second and let it just kind of speak to us because I was talking to Michael and Jackie Aldava. For like the last year, they had a moment about a year ago when God showed up in their life. And it was fun to watch. Brian Shorson was their group leader, and he's coming up to me. He's like, man, you need to come over here. This dude's about to meet Jesus. And I go over there, and big old Mike, dude, he's just trembling. And he starts praying. The next Sunday, dude's trucking it with this woman, and I'm standing down here for prayer. He's like, this is my wife. She needs Jesus too. And she's like, and something happened to them. Something biblical happened to them that radically changed them. They began to learn to walk. They began to learn and, and realize that they needed people around them to pour into them. And now I'm beginning to see them pick up pace and they're starting to learn what it looks like to actually run with endurance, but not just because they're doing it, but there is a fire in them that when I see them, I just get a little more excited every time. And I say, God, what, what you're doing in them, do it in me too. I want more of that. I watch my wife wake up early in the morning and pray. I watch her during worship just lay down and just cry out. And I go, I want, I want more of that. 
I see the students who will come in here and just flood the front, just passionate for God, and they're showing up all over the building, all the time serving, and I go, I want more of that. I see people like Trisha Socks who will come up here and pour into our kids day after day after day, and it consumes her, and I go, I want more of that. I see so many of you. There's a, there's a woman, I, God, I forgot your name. She brings coffee every Sunday morning. She's Will in the cart. This woman will come up here and make coffee for us because she loves Jesus so much. I love people like that. Make more coffee. But we see so many people around us that have something we wish we had. I look to me, Mom, this old grandma lady, and I'm like, I want that hunger she's got for more of Jesus. Can we take those people off the shelf and realize we can stand right next to them as people of faith? You know what makes you different from them? Absolutely nothing. The only thing that's going to change it is if you're willing to step into it. So don't move yet. You need the Lord to begin to speak something to you. We're going to sing this song about a hunger and a thirst that needs to begin to really rise up in you to realize they got something that I need. I may have gone down the journey a little bit and fell down, and I didn't know how to stand back up, but they got something I need. I don't care what it is. It's just something is there, and I need it. And I need to know if there's some hungry and thirsty people in this house because I'm going to have you come up here in a minute. And they're going to pray over you for the fire and the passion that's in them to be given to you as well. But I want us to take a moment and let the song just wash over you for just a moment. Are you hungry and thirsty for more? Because right now, I want you to respond. I don't want you to come up here unless you are absolutely sure and serious because you don't know what you're asking for. We might say yes and then walk out of here and the Lord says, give it all away, and you say no. Be careful what you ask from the Lord. But if you want more, if you want a hunger and a thirst, if you want a fire down in your soul that cannot be contained, that cannot be controlled, I would ask that you come right now down here at the very front of this room. racing right now 
And it's because I know the Lord wants to do so much in y'all's lives that it's just on fire right now because he wants to do miracles. He wants to do wonders. He wants to do everything in your lives. Um, you took the step today just to step forward. And um, that's all we did. You just have to be obedient and say yes. That's the only difference from Mima, or just a person that sits in the back and listens to Mima. is just, just say yes. And when he calls, it doesn't always sound like what you want it to sound like, but just say yes. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Jackie. She's going to start us off in prayer today. God, you're so good. You are so good. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for showing up. I thank you that we are able to just be still and that you are able to just come. I just see the roof of the church opening up and heaven coming. He is here. You are in his presence. Lord, I pray that you just release that fire that is inside of us and unleash it in this room on every single person who is wanting more. Lord, just let them step out in courage and in faith and let them cry out to you for more. Lord, I thank you for the grace that you've shown us. And I ask that you pour the same grace into them. That that promise that you've made to each and every single one of them up here today, that you reignite that promise and let them know that promise is still there. That all it takes is just a little bit of faith, a little step of obedience, and God, you show up big, far more abundantly, is what it says in Ephesians, than we can ever ask or imagine. Lord, I just pray that everything that you've done in our lives, the miracles that you've worked in our lives through our children, through ourselves, through other people, that you work those same miracles in these folks here today, that when they leave here, they're different than when they walked in, that they lay down their old lives and their past, and they say, yes, Lord, today is the day that I make this change and I and I turn a 180 from where I was and I just want more of you every day. And I pray that they wake up every single morning like it's a new day. That they wake up and the first thing they think is, Lord, what do, what do you have for us today? And that we just sit still in your presence until you say move. Lord, I pray that for every single heart and every single soul and every single spirit in here today. And it's in your holy name we praise and we worship you. Amen.